loved ones. Welcome to Management 3130, Summer 2022. Um, this is an introductory video. There are a lot of preliminary things that we need to, you need to be aware of, we need to discuss. And uh, I don't think this video will be very long, but it'll be rich in content because everything we talk about in the next few minutes will have clear implications for the way this course is conducted. So, shortest intro, I'm Bill Norton. I am a uh, relatively long-serving member of this faculty, uh, but that ends soon. I retire on 30 June, which is the end of our fiscal year. Uh, when I finished the spring semester this year, that wrapped up a 30-year career in academia. So this extra five weeks is just icing on the cake. But um, when I say introduce myself, I, it, it is well, I don't think any of you would have had me because this is a principal's course and I haven't taught it for the business in several years. Um, I am uh, in no way important or special but I am very different from most faculty, uh, simply because I've had a lot of life experiences outside of academia. Um, this retirement that's upcoming on the 30th of June will be my third. I spent four and a half years on active duty in the Army. I was first an enlisted man, then an NCO, then a commissioned officer. Um, I had uh, twin peaks, I would say, in my, my four and a half year military career. The first was I had an opportunity to lead a reconnaissance platoon in the Central Highlands of Vietnam for most of the year. And that was extraordinary in ways I can't even describe. And then the other thing that was uh, extraordinary from the perspective of uh, a young soldier in his career is when I returned from Vietnam, I had no idea what my assignment was going to be. So when my leave was over, I probably had a three week leave, when my leave was over, I learned that I was going to Fort Benning to be a resident instructor at the United States Army Infantry School. And that also was an incredible assignment. Moreover, it was my first immersion in adult education, and it's part of what eventually led me to a career in academia. So, Four and a half years active duty as an infantryman. I punched out of the army, putzed around for a couple of years, and then got a bachelor's degree in accounting. So I practiced in Atlanta as a CPA for 17 years. For 14 of those 17 years, I was a principal in my own firm. So I have signed the front of paychecks. I've interviewed hundreds of, of uh, candidates that look just like you. Uh, degrees in business and hired and developed dozens of them. So I have a, pra a rich practical understanding of what uh, what this post-secondary education leads to in terms of career paths. So I decided in my early 40s that I wanted to uh, move from industry, from business, to uh, an academic career. I merged my firm with a CPA firm that was comfortably sized. After the merger, we were three partners, 12 professional staff, 12 CPAs, and four or five support staff. And uh, I stayed with that firm for three years to get my clients and my staff well integrated. And then I literally gracefully retired. I announced to everyone, my partners do this before we started. I announced to everyone that I was leaving public practice to go to academia. So then I went to USC, the right coast USC, where men are men and women are quite remarkable. Very different from the left coast USC. So I did a PhD in strategic management, how firms compete. And uh, as I said earlier in this video, this spring literally represented the end of a 30 year career in academia. Um, I started at Indiana University, and we stayed there for three years. I moved to the University of Louisville, wonderful experience there for seven years. And then this position opened up 
and my wife and I were just overjoyed to be in coastal Georgia. So, um, with no embellishment, my adult life has been warrior, practitioner, teacher, scholar. So the point that I'm, the reason I shared that with you from an introduction perspective is, is to circle back to what I said. I'm neither important nor special, but I have a very different perspective, a very different worldview than most of my colleagues, because virtually the only thing they know is the inside of the classroom. So, let's jump into the stuff that uh, directly impacts you. I have uh, I've activated folio for your section, and uh, today is uh, today is seven May, twenty twenty two. It's a glorious Saturday afternoon in coastal Georgia, and uh, I posted the syllabus so that you at least have some awareness of what we're doing and when we're doing it. And I want to point out that um, we as a department, the management department, gosh, we probably teach nine or ten sections or more principles every semester because it's in the core. And there are 4,000 students in the Parker College of Business and everybody has to have it. So truly, we probably teach ten sections a semester. And for that reason, we have one faculty member that, that has some oversight. And she's chosen a textbook, and we are all adopting it so that every one of you, no matter what section you're in, has some sort of a consistent experience. So the textbook is uh, Kanicki and Williams. Let me find the syllabus. Kanicki and Williams, Management, a Practical Introduction. Now, we're adopting 10E, the 10th edition. That is the most current one. Um, I have requested a review copy. I haven't received it. So since I haven't received it, if I don't get it the next few days, my lecture notes will come from 9E, not 10E. But that shouldn't hurt you because my lecture notes all deal with concepts. I don't, uh, I don't grab a slide deck and bang through 50 slides so that you see every paragraph on every page. If that's all I could do, y'all, y'all can just read the book. Would you agree? So I hope to add some value. So when I assign you a chapter, I read the chapter. I identify five or six or eight concepts that I think are significant, and then I develop them. We talk about them in meaningful ways. So if I have to start with lecture notes from 9E, that is not, uh, not fatal, neither fatal nor vital. Now, if I find that there's a substantive change in either the order of presentation or the content, I'll post a folio update, and if I have to, I'll record new videos to, to reflect that if I need to. So, that was the first comment I wanted to make to you, and that is that we're adopting 10E, but since I haven't received a review copy, my lecture notes are from the ninth edition. Again. They all deal with concepts rather than page numbers, so that should not work a hardship on you. Now, the next thing that's important is, is simply the recognition that this is a summer school class. And if you look at the syllabus, it's the session numbers that are relevant, not the date. You could view five sessions in one day if you wish. The only times dates matter, and they do matter, is if you have a deliverable. If you're taking an exam, if you have a critical thinking exercise to do, or anything of the sort. So it is the session number that's critical. Uh, in the syllabus for every class, I have both a session number and a date. And again, as I say, the only time the dates are important are if we have uh, something due. Number three, I have only, <clears throat> excuse me, only put the syllabus on folio thus far. I will quickly augment that. There are a number of things I'm going to put on there. Um, so what I want you to do is uh, I want you to 
probably you should you should configure your folio page so it gives you an alert every time I post something. But what I will typically do is I will uh, if I'm simply adding content, you'll see the modules appear, whatever that may be. If uh, if I have something to share with you, our only conduit for me talking to you as a class is for me to post an update on Folio. And when I do, it'll be titled Update, whatever that day's date is. And certainly I want you to read it and be aware of what I said. So please, I don't have very much content on Folio yet, just the syllabus. But please uh, set your page so that you get alerts or or visit Folio frequently to see what's on there. Ah. <clears throat> many of the classes, many of the videos that are posted on my YouTube channel, and I'll talk about that in just a moment, were filmed even as much as two summers ago. As long as I'm dealing with the same textbook and the same content, they're still alive and well. They're still vibrant. So here's what I want you to understand. Many of those videos have an attendance verification story and question in them. I did that because when I recorded them, it was the very first time that I'd ever taught online. I have an attendance policy in all of my classes, and I impose that on my students in my online classes. Uh, and, and it worked in my view well. It created an enormous workload for me because I was literally answering a thousand emails a week. But. Uh, but the point that I'm moving towards is I am not holding you to any standard for attendance. So when you hear the attendance verification story in the video, and then towards the end of the video, you hear the question, you get to ignore both of them. If you enjoy them, hallelujah. And if it's an eye roller, that's okay. I still love it. So now, clearly the purpose of this video is to sort of lay out shared protocols, how we're gonna conduct this summer session. Um, I treasure direct interaction. In fact, when I walk off campus for the last time on 30 June, the only thing I'll really miss will be my interaction with you. Uh, whether it's in the hallway of the classroom, my office, a local coffee shop, a rifle range, whatever the case may be. Uh, I treasure my interactions with you. And for that reason, I very much, much, very much, much miss it when I have to teach online. Uh, but I, I do, it's easy for me to make a promise to you because I've been keeping this promise for three decades. My intention is to create the best learning environment that I possibly can. And I, I generally I generally meet that objective. So clearly this video must be viewed first before you view any of, any of the content videos. I want to mention something about all of my videos. I'm not being flippant or cynical when I say this, but I would say to you that my videos are rated PG-13. So the reason I tell you that is I don't want you to let younger siblings, if you're doing this at home, don't get let younger siblings watch these videos. The last thing I want to have happen is your five-year-old sister going to your mom and saying, Mom, Dr. Norton said butthole. What's a butthole? So please, don't let your kids watch the videos. The next thing that is a, um, a legitimate comment to make 
is I know there will be bloopers. I will say things that I don't typically regret, but that need to be clarified or corrected. And uh, I, I say that because everything I record for this class is raw. I have no editing software. I have no intention of developing skills in that domain. So I push record at the start of a video and I push record when I'm done. And whatever happens between those two anchor points is raw. By raw, I mean unedited. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my choice of YouTube. Um, for some people that may be curious. The first time I ever taught online was the spring of 20, when we were forced by the COVID lockdowns to transform all of our face-to-face -face classes to online classes. The Board of Regents gave the faculty four days to do it, literally. And they said in their announcement, they said, we realize that this is uh, uh, time compressed, very, very short window. So for that reason, we, the Board of Regents, give you, the faculty, complete autonomy. You can choose any platform that you wish. So. I initially thought about either Zoom or Google Hangouts, and I very quickly discarded those. Because in both cases, you would be required to be in front of a monitor at a particular day, at a particular time, just like attending a class. And I reasoned that because of the disruptive nature of the COVID lockdown, first of all, let me all be scattered all over the country. But uh, the other piece of that is that some of you will be working two jobs, some of you will be caring for family members, some of you may be traveling. The point is, I couldn't expect you to, to essentially meet for an online class, you know, specific day, specific time. So I thought to myself, what platform can I use that's accessible anytime, from anywhere, using any device, and the only answer to that question was YouTube. So I opened a YouTube channel to post class videos. And when I did, this was March of 20, I discovered that I was the only faculty member in the Parker College of Business that had opened a YouTube channel. Now, this is a couple of years later. Uh, many of my colleagues may have joined me. I know, I know faculty at other schools have used it, but uh, it, it is really, uh, it's been robust. It's really done precisely what I want it to do. So um, that, that is uh, the reason that, uh, that I chose YouTube for this platform. And I've already posted probably maybe 75 videos on the channel. Let me say this now because I haven't mentioned the name. The name of my educational channel on YouTube is Bill Norton. Parker College of Business. If you go to that channel on YouTube and then put in a session number, session two, management 3130, or whatever it is you're looking for, boom, it will appear. So again, the channel name is Bill Norton, Parker College of Business. And of course, inside of that, you can search for the session and the class, and that's all you need. I want to talk to you briefly about uh, two things, I guess. Um, some design features about Folio that, that I use, and then maybe even a greater issue, issue and that is how you and I communicate. Uh, I've told you already that I would use Folio for announcements, and I will post much more content, and generally it will be very clear and straightforward what I've added. Um, I also want to point out that for every graded exercise, for every one, there will be a separate folio in Dropbox. So when you do a graded exercise, there will always be a time deadline, and I expect you to simply upload your, uh, your assignment into folio. Uh, and, and if you have difficulties with that, I can't solve those problems. That is an IT challenge. Please, please be sensitive to that.
don't wait until the last minute on anything. So that's, uh, I just wanted to tell you about Dropbox. The second thing I want to tell you about the design of Folio, I do not use the gradebook feature. Uh, there, are, there are very legitimate reasons for that. The primary reason is if a faculty member has any class where any assignment is weighted beyond just 100 points, we have to publish on Gradebook the weighted score, and that is deceptive. Uh, I learned that a few years ago when I was using it. One of my kids thought she had a B in the class because she got an 85 on her first midterm. The midterms were weighted, three of them were weighted to 500 points. So to get from 300 to 500, you sum the scores and you multiply them by 1.67. And when you take 58 and multiply it by 1.67, it becomes 85. So this particular student thought she had to be when indeed she was rocking really a deep F, way down there in F territory. So I don't use gradebook. When I grade an assignment in Dropbox, there is a feedback box, and that's where I will put your grade. And I'm willing to bet that you can add. So, don't use gradebook. When I grade an assignment in Dropbox, I will put your grade, the earned grade on that assignment, in the feedback box. It's not likely I'll put a lot of feedback in there, but you will certainly get your grade, and it'll be in a timely manner. And then the last thing I want to share with you on this particular topic is, uh, is, is a communication uh, comment. Uh, there are some faculty that, that invite communications through Folio. I am not one of them. Do not try to reach me through Folio or on Tinder, Tumblr, Instagram, or any other social media platform. If you need to communicate with me, I have a university email account. I have one and one only. It's in the syllabus, which means it's on folio, but it's also intuitive. It is Bill Norton at georgiasouthern.edu. The same exact template as your email, just a different, uh, a different identifier. So the point is, if you need to communicate with me anytime for any reason, send me an email. And when, or if, you send me an email, you must, must, this is a requirement I impose, you must identify the class you're in and the section. I'm in 3130, section 03, section 05, whatever it is. I'm not going to go searching for you. If you send me an email and you, don't, you do not identify class and section, I'll just dump it without reading it, and you won't get a response. If you do what I'm asking you to do, identify class and section, I will acknowledge every email you send me relatively fast. Not necessarily same day, but relatively fast. Now, I have a note about the use of sessions once more. Um, I have a copy of your syllabus right here. For every class, there are two identifiers, a session number and a date. The session number is critical for everything you do in this class this summer. The dates only matter if you have a graded assignment due. It turns out that uh, your second midterm is on 31 May. Why on earth are we meeting on 31 May? Isn't that Memorial Day? Isn't that the day that we set aside every year to honor the millions of soldiers and sailors and marines and airmen who have given their lives 
for the liberty that you and I enjoy? It is. Not during summer, a term. During class. So, um, I have in several cases, I italicize and embolden everything that's a deliverable for you and every time that I make a presentation to you. The reason I do that is I've learned over the years that many of my students like to be able to print a PowerPoint presentation, perhaps in, in a note form, two or three to the page, so that you can make notes on them as the presentation is made. You have no obligation to do that. But hundreds of my students over my career have passed without giving advance notice, and I'm happy to. If I make a PowerPoint presentation to you, and I plan to make several, maybe four or five, it will be my intellectual work property. It'll be original content, and it'll be focused on a topic, leadership, ethics, decision making, whatever it is. It's not something that I dragged out of the instructor's resource bank. So it'll be uh, very much on point to what we're doing. So again, the session number is controlled. The only time the dates are important is if you have a deliverable, some graded exercise. So please, visit the syllabus regularly. Be sensitive to dates. Um, the syllabus tells you about late, uh, late papers, problems, whatever you have to do. I have the simplest rule if you miss a deadline because of an excused absence, you have seven days to make that up, seven calendar days from the due date. If you do not make it up in that window, zero, the big bacon. And the only time you can make up an exercise is if it's an excused absence. Let me quickly run through what the university regards as an excused absence. There are four, in no particular order. The university observes a number of religious holidays and they post them on the university website. The second thing that is an excused absence is your illness. I love dogs more than I love most people, but if your German short hair pointer needs to go to the vet, you're late turning something in, that doesn't make the cut on your illness. And of course, your illness has to be documented. Whether you go to an immediate care place off campus or the voodoo shop in the health sciences building or your primary care physician, if it's gonna be an excused absence, I have to have documentation to meet the university standard. So the second type of excused absence your documented illness. The third type of absence that is excused is, is unbelievably disruptive and heartbreaking for many of us, and that is if you lose a loved one. If you lose a loved one to go home be with family, attend a funeral, anything like that, that is an excused absence. Once again, it has to be documented. Um, a church bulletin, an obituary from a newspaper, uh, anything that, that would document the fact that it's a member of your family. And the fourth permitted excused absence is if you, as a student, are doing something to represent this fine university. If you're in a sales competition team, you go to Kennesaw State to kick butt. Uh, if you're a student athlete, if you're a cheerleader, whatever the case may be. So if you're doing something to represent the university, that is the fourth type. So in no particular order, religious holidays, your documented illness, the documented death of a loved one, and you representing Georgia Southern University. Those are the four excused absences that the university recognizes and in every case, you'd have to provide me with documentation. And if, if that is true, 
If you miss the due day of an exercise, test anything at all, you have seven days to make it up with no penalty whatsoever. Let me talk to you briefly about exams. We have three or four. We have four midterms and a final. <clears throat> um, the only legitimate way of me having an examination with you being remotely somewhere else, geographically removed, also removed in time and space. You get to view these videos whenever you decide you want to view these videos. So the only way that I can meaningfully do an exam is to do an essay test. And I want to point out that if I give you an essay test, I'm looking for a short essay as an answer. One or two sentences is not an essay. So when I give you an exam, they will all be essay tests and I expect every answer to be a short essay. And in that short essay, all you have to do is demonstrate to me that you understand the concept clearly and that you communicate it well. And if you do that, you'll crush it. You'll get crazy good grades. Now, here's something that relates to the essay test I'm gonna give you. I despise cheating in any form. Uh, I speak to it briefly on the syllabus. If I discover that any of you, if any of you has cheated, and I have anything that is evidential, I will give you an F in the course, not just on that assignment, and I'll make a concerted effort to get you expelled from the university. I may not be successful now that you know my heart, you're on notice. So the point that I'm moving towards is for that reason, because I, I've never in 30 years, though I've tried hard, I've never found a way to stop or even really reduce cheating. My decision on the essay tests means that the questions that I post on the essay test will be original. They will have never been used before. So if some kid took a picture of this and posted that JPEG file to one of those cheating websites like Chegg or Course Hero, that's not going to help you because every question that I ask will be original to this class. Nothing that I've ever done in the future will be the same as what I do this summer. The second thing that's true about every essay question that I ask is that the question will come from a concept that I spoke about in one of these videos. Words that come out of my mouth as I, as I describe and develop a concept, will be the basis for me writing an essay question. Now, what that means is you won't be able to go to the textbook to find the answer, and you darn sure ain't gonna be able to whip out your phone and go to Google and look for it. You'll have to have watched the video and paid attention and made notes. Now, we're only doing, since we're doing four midterms that's only like typically it's four chapters for each one so you could review every video in probably three or four hours in their entirety and be well prepared for the exam but i want you to understand that every question will be original never used in the past and every essay question that i ask this summer will come from a concept that i directly spoke about in class which means you won't find it anywhere else in the universe. So I hope that gives you some good insights. Um, the next thing is just sort of uh, me addressing the, the time compression of summer school. 
you are bright people. You know that every summer school class you ever take for you to earn three credit hours has to reflect 15 hours worth of, 15 weeks rather, of coursework. So what the faculty do is we take 15 weeks of coursework and we compress it into five. So that makes the pace frenetic. It's every day you're getting hammered with something. So the first thing I would urge you to do is stay on track. Go to Folio often to see if I posted anything new. Look at the syllabus often. View the videos as often as you can. Now, I'm gonna make a suggestion and it's only that. Uh, I would hope you don't need me to tell you how to do college level work. Um, but I want the suggestion is, I would like you to augment every video that you see. The videos are gonna be sometimes as short as 35 minutes, sometimes a bit longer. It's driven by content and how deeply I need to develop it. But they're not brutal in length. For every video, every video will address a chapter. For every video and every chapter, I'd like you to plan on augmenting that video by 45 minutes of study. Reading the textbook, highlighting, journaling, writing down things that you think are important. That reinforces learning, and when it comes time for me to evaluate your relative command over this material, you'll crush it. So, you don't have to do what I suggested, but I think it would pay dividends to you. Not to me. I have three degrees. I'm in a good place. I want you to finish this undergraduate program, leave this campus, and have a great job that permits you to live with independence and dignity. That's my goal. So, please consider, first of all, staying on track. Don't get behind because it's virtually impossible to catch up. And, and I really think there's a lot of value if you're willing to dedicate 45 minutes per session, not even an hour. Read the chapter, I like journal. When I say journal, write down concepts that seem to be important to you. So we are now at the end of this introductory presentation. I have nothing more to share with you that talks about the conduct of our summer school course together. Your next video would be Session 1, Management 3130. Please remember that the dates are irrelevant because I filmed a lot of this stuff, some of it as far back as two years ago. But it's the same textbook, which means it's precisely the same content. So, Reach out to me if you need to talk to me via email, and uh, I look forward to us having a, a productive summer session together. Love you.